have to come far. <laughs> Christine, one of these days I'm going to decide what I'm actually going to do for the rest of my working life. <laughs> okay, as I know where the lights are, I'm going to dim you a little bit. It's much better for sleeping than that. And <laughs> okay? Fine. All right, well, um, about two years ago, no, yes, two years ago, uh, I was thrust into talking about shale gas. And I've actually given probably about 30 talks of it, so to some extent, um, uh, I'm sick of the sound of my own voice, but I'll go for <laughs> Right, this picture, I just thought I'd put it up. This is where the MPs and the presenters stand on Newsnight when they're being interviewed. So I thought I'd get the chance to stand there, so I'm not going to get my picture. <laughs> that's, that's Palace Green, right? This is the House of Parliament. Uh, so I thought it was good enough for Jeremy Paxman, it's certainly good enough for me. <laughs> Okay, I always like things that cause politicians unrest. Sorry, Sebastian. <laughs> Fear and trembling at number 10. It's not the fracking drilling, it's your fracking budget. We only just had the budget. This was two years ago budget, for all the same. I still like this. I still like the sentiment. Okay. So the quick. And he's going to be even closer if he's late. <laughs> the question is, what do we actually want? Okay. Well... To reduce the use of coal and hydrocarbons, probably for sure, because I actually have this nightmare that some, somewhere down the road I meet a little green man, and we must go easier on my drinking. <laughs> and he says to me, you had this wonderful black liquid, and you burnt it all when you could have made medicines, you could have made plastics, you could have made all sorts of things. And I think that's probably true. I sort of sit in my car and I think, where the bloody hell did we find all the pepper for these guys? And I actually do know that, but it still stands me. So, reducing hydrocarbons by some means is probably what we need to do. But also, I think the most important, that's a, that's a, a bus which is coming to collide with us in a few years. Uh, before that, a train will take us out, and it's probably called Super too. Because at this minute, here, it's 400 parts per million of CO2. And if models are to be believed, if we get to 450 parts per million, we'll have at least 2 degrees centigrade global warming. Um, and it's, it's increasing, and in my students here, to tell me how much it's increasing that year, I won't embarrass them by asking them, it's about 2.5 parts per million, which only gives us 20 years to get to 450, and I might just about have 20 years left in me. Um, some of you have got a lot more, maybe some of you have got less, but never mind, that's another story. Um, but I've been working in universities for 40 years, right? When I first went to Swansea, they were going to build a seven barrage. Still haven't done it now. So, and actually, about 20 years is a very, very short time to know the oil. And we want reliable economic sources of lower carbon energy. And when do we want it? Well, effectively, we need it now, as we'll see as I go through this. But if you look at this breakdown of where we get energy for a variety of uses, Oil is still a very big part for transport, for electricity generation, industry, and domestic. Okay? A large part of that is oil. A small part of transport is gas, a very small part. Coal, still very, very important globally for electricity generation. We haven't got many <coughs> coal fired 747s, um, although they have had some fires on them from the batteries, but that's a really different again. Um, coal for industry, coal for domestics. Over the, over the globe, coal is extremely important still. Gas becoming increasingly so for generation, for industry, and a few of this. Nuclear, important for electricity generation. Probably should be more important than it is, but that's just how we go. So hydrocarbons are still a very big part of that mix, as we'll see. But I've been saying this for quite a long while. I'm glad to see that someone in the papers is saying this now that in the next two years we'll actually close six, possibly seven, possibly eight, if you believe Scottish and Southern today, perhaps even more than that, uh, coal-fired power stations, and some other uh, gas-fired power stations too, Kings North, Grain, Ironbridge, Lidkit, Foley, Kensley, so widely spread across the country, but probably eight to nine gigawatts of energy out of about 50 to 60 gigawatts, which is what we use. So we're probably talking 15 to 20 percent of energy base load taken out in the next two years. That's 
I don't think the government's actually got a plan to actually accommodate that. While simultaneously across the world, actually, coal is growing. There are about 1,200 coal plants in planning, most of them in China and India. But in actual fact, in the UK, we have an immediate, we have an immediate problem. This is Drax, you can still make a power station of the pretty if you choose the right time of night. And of course, this is how it's going to look over the next few years or so. Okay. Gas, I think this is not right, but gas will probably uh, increase. Coal will certainly decrease because of the reason that we won't have the coal-fired power stations. Nuclear is decreasing because we haven't built any more. But demand will grow, and if demand increases like this, we're going to have to fill it. Now, if we fill it with wind, which some think is possible, uh, we need 30 gigawatts of wind capacity by 2020. And each turbine, actually, despite saying 3 megawatts on the tin, right, it isn't like wrong, so you'll actually deliver about, if you, you'll get, a, you'll get a, a megawatt out if you're lucky. So it's not that simple. That probably is 30,000 wind turbines at uh, the utility they have. And 30 gigawatts is about 50% of our capacity. That's quite very challenging. And where are we now? Right, this is just, I've chosen a day, a really bad day, this is what happens, like today, the freezing cold day, this is the 30th of November, uh, when we had 20 gigawatts of coal generation, 7 of nuclear, we had 17 of gas, we had 160 kilowatts of wind. Okay. That's not base load. Okay. 170, 170 kilowatts wouldn't boil many cups of tea, I'm afraid. And of course, nuclear is not looking very uh, positive because the government and EDF and various people can't agree on prices. And what a particular, particular uh, thing which is important is that West Cumbria has decided it does not want to proceed with plans for a, a waste repository there. So we'll come in. Now, the chairman of West Cumbria County Council patted himself on the back as to how environmentally it was and how people would welcome the fact that there wasn't a waste repository in the Lake District. But another way of looking at it is they've now voted for 10 years more of having um, 100 tons of plutonium plus a whole load of other things actually on the surface at Sutherfield. You may not realise we have 111 tons of uh, processed plutonium when you only need 4 kilograms to make a nuclear weapon. That's 25,000 ish nuclear weapons worth. That's quite scary. That's not as, that's not as secure and as environmental as the chairman of West Country has named that statement. You might like to think. So, likely in the national grid, right, it's not from the national grid here, because 150 years ago, if you wanted something to heat your house, you took an axe, and you went outside and you chopped down a tree. George Washington did it so it's good enough for me. And you burned logs, or you went outside with a spade and you dug peat. Or if you're lucky, you went and got some coal. But you got it locally. But some had a lot and some had a little. So we invented the national grid which centrally generates energy and circulates around. But now it's a bit like supermarket meat. Uh, everybody wants it and nobody knows where it comes from. And look where that's, look where that's led us. There's no horse meat in here, but you know what I mean. It is now sterilized. Everybody wants it, but nobody wants the consequences. We don't want nuclear. We don't want oil. This is the condo. We don't want coal. We actually... Uh, a dilemma is that our env environmentally, environmentalists want wind and not wind, so it's actually quite a tricky one. And I work on wind as well, actually, so, so say no to nuclear, say no to ugly wind farms, say no to fossil fuels, say hello to thermal underwear and big sweaters. <laughs> and of course, energy security. Okay. Well, I guess a prime example of this is that in 2008-2009, uh, that period, the Ukraine and the Soviet Union, the Russia by then, had big spats over gas being well, supposed to be stolen by the Ukrainians from the pipelines. I've been told that may well be true. But that's not really the issue. Um, gas Putin was able to switch off power to the whole of Europe through the Siberian pipelines. And actually, fact, those pipelines run from up here in Stockton Field, widely across Europe, all the way down into Turkey here. Okay? 
And so we actually came to an old pass where there was virtually no gas being supplied. Lots of people died, lots of people died immediately, possibly a few more, probably a few thousand more died from hypothermia later. At that, pre at that time we didn't suffer too much, part, but only because gas prices didn't rise high enough in Europe for our gas to be bought into Europe. Because there's nothing to stop our gas, the free market of gas, and gas is what's called a fungible commodity. I did eventually go and look what, what that means. It means that gas you put in one end is assumed to be the same as gas that comes out of the other end. It's like electricity. You, there's no name on the electrons which go in. That's why you can have EDF energy or BG electricity, because it's thought to be this fun, good words and fungible. You now know when to use it. And in today's news, Centriga unveils a 10 billion gas supply with the US to heat up to 2 million UK homes with American shale gas, right? Okay. Wholesale gas prices soared in Britain over the weekend. They've gone down now a little bit because the interconnector between Zeebrugge and, and Bacton in, on the east coast of East Anglia failed. So we've actually uh, bought liquefied natural gas. Now we have the Dragon facility in North Haven at huge expense. We also built a pipeline all the way from Wales, all the way to the rest of the country. We have not landed a single tanker of liquefied natural gas since October. The reason being is the Japanese and the Koreans, and actually strangely the Argentinians, for a reason I'll tell you in a second, have bought it all. The Japanese, because they've closed all of the nuclear power stations because of Fukushima. Korea has two nuclear power stations out of commission. And Argentina tried to nationalize the Spanish oil company there, who then said, to you with your gas. So that's where the gas has gone. We have now paid top dollar to actually get three tankers. I'm not sure what we paid, but we buy it on the spot market, and whoever pays most will land it. Until it lands in Milford Haven, free on board, it's not ours. Somebody bids more in the next couple of days, those tankers will not land. Now that's not security. And that gas comes from Qatar, through the Gulf of Aden, past Somali pirates. This is where I did my PhD. When I did my PhD, we were buzzed by Russian MiGs, because the Russians had missile bases in Berbera. Uh, but now we are actually taken by Somali pirates. And there are oil tankers already there. But the consequences of actually hijacking a liquefied natural gas tanker are quite horrendous. But that's not energy security as I see it. So is it shale gas after all? Maybe it is, we'll see. We're going to discuss some serious issues. So where do hydrocarbons live? In the ground, obviously. But perhaps you should ask yourself before that, where do they come from? And they come from these shales. It's a bit of scratchy uh, shale from a core somewhere in the coal mountains here. Okay. Gas and oil come from shales. Most of it escaped hundreds of millions of years ago. A lot of it was trapped in places that we have to go and find like this. But much, much more of it went. It was taken at the atmosphere, we worked by biological organisms. Don't imagine that biological organisms can't actually deal with oil and gas, they can give them time. So conventional, in inverted commas, gas sits in special traps where we actually have porous rocks. This is a bit of keel bed. Right? It's a porous red sandstone. Right? It's got a high porosity and those, in other words, got lots of holes in it. And those holes are actually quite well connected. That's ideal for storing gas, ideal for storing oil, and ideal for storing water. Makes a good aquifer too. Because you can pump fluids in and out of that quite <coughs> little. Okay? Most people here have seen rock if you're not geology oriented, I usually pass that round. Okay? Some sits in coal. This is a piece of coal. It's a really beautiful anthracite. This is 96% carbon. Right? That, probably the finest you could get anywhere. This is from Kenhydra in South Wales. To get another piece of this, it costs you a billion quid. It's formed to bits now, unfortunately. Rob with me in South Wales. The gas sits in there, trapped in the structure. They're about the same size. That will hold ten times as much gas as that will. 
because the gas is absorbed into the structure and a liquid light layer by a force called the Leonard Jones potential. And if you don't think that's significant, Leonard Jones was the founding professor of physics at the road. That's why I always tell you that. And shales come somewhere in between that. Shales contain some free gas, but a fair amount is trapped. And this, if I pour water on that, it'll actually soak it up. This won't. It has very little porosity and even less permeability. The pores in there are not connected. In the sandstone, this is what we have. We have sand grains with gaps around about them. Here we are. Here's an actual picture of the Bunter sandstein, the Bunter, showed sandstone. Permian. Lots of gaps. This is actually a dolomite carbonate rock from the Gawa field, the giant gas fields in Saudi Arabia. Both of them have got lots of holes in them, and those holes are connected. They're good for oil and gas. So I've just said what I've said here. All the gas in coal is adsorbed. All the gas in sandstones is in the porosity. In shales, it's somewhere in between. Now, the measure of porosity is the Darcy. Sands can have um, a thousand Darcy's permeability. It's a sort of measure of how easy it is to flow through it. Shales can have about 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9. So there's, there can be 10 to the 12 range of this permeability. Well, just a little quick pictures. In gas shales, some of it is free gas because there are fractures. A lot of it is in the mineral phase, absorbed in this liquid-like layer. So these shields are the source of gas. Why haven't we got it out before? Well, the reason is it's pretty hard to get it out. If you find a nice reservoir like this and start pumping it, gas comes out very easily. Okay. It's actually quite easy to suck gas out of this, coal bed methane, which we're doing, trying to do on campus. This sort of stuff is very reluctant to give up its material. Now, when you see shales on the beach, they're actually very fractured. You would have thought they've got lots of pathways. It's not quite as simple in the ground, but they need to be at least 20 meters thick. They need to have been down to five kilometers, because five kilometers is the depth where it's hot enough to cook the little beasties that fall and form this amongst the clear particles. If you don't go down that deep, you don't actually get gas. You don't need to know too much of these things. <coughs> Those are the critical things. So it's commonly been now, well, it's now commonly known as unconventional oil and gas. But in actual fact, it's really the source. That's where oil and gas came from. So just a couple of examples. On the left, he's <laughs> unconventional, that's John McCrick. Right? I can never really get on with him. This is Victor Meldrum, who my wife says are. If I shave my beard off, I would start to resemble a bit, at least in attitude. You can't tell the difference between them. This is Boy George, rather smooth. Sorry, this is, this is George. This is Boy George. Conventional he is, unconventional he is. And you can tell the difference between them. Unconventional gas on the left, conventional gas on the right. You can't tell the difference. Because they're the same chemistry, they smell the same, they burn the same. They are the same. I was uh, speaking in Brussels before Christmas. Someone from an NGO said, we're completely opposed to unconventional hydrocarbons. The doctor said, what do you mean? You can't be opposed to hydrocarbons. That's a consistent ideological position. Right? You're not allowed to have a car, and you're not allowed to have plastic, and you're, but you can be opposed to it. You cannot be opposed to unconventional hydrocarbons, because they aren't any different. So, took that message away with that. <laughs> <laughs> so this shale gas we're hearing so much about, where is it? Well, what, what's interesting is to see where it isn't. Very little of it is actually in the Middle East. There must be some because they've got oil, right? And they wouldn't have oil if they didn't have a source rock. But there's much less of it. It doesn't actually feature on this map, okay? Loads in Canada, loads in the US, a lot in Mexico, loads in South America. Quite a lot in Europe, I'll come to Europe in a minute. South Africa, a bit in the Maghreb, uh, bits in China, probably quite a lot in China. A huge amount in Australia. I'm actually going to the Canning Basin in three weeks to talk to them about shale gas. And in the UK, where is it? Okay. 
Um, well, it's actually probably anywhere that's got rocks younger than the Carboniferous at surface. It's not in northern Scotland because all of that, all of those rocks went. It's not in bits of, well, it might be in these shields, either Ordovician and Silurian shields, but uh, there's, there's some in Ireland, but not here and not there. But more or less, if you draw a line going to the south southeast from here, somewhere underneath the rest of the geology are Numurian shales. Because there's coal underneath most of that, as we know. So there will, there will be shale gas. And in actual fact, there's shale gas probably in this neck of the woods, not proving that popular with the local residents, Bolton and Sussex. <laughs> it's there. It's an island, God's little joke, because it actually sits astride the border. So Eric could actually extract Northern Ireland gas with a deviated well right under the border. And vice versa. That would be really fun, that would. <laughs> uh, I've been to talk to Stormont and I've been to talk in Dublin too. <laughs> to give you a bit of perspective too, well actually this is what these shells look like in coal. Actually they're quite shiny and nice actually, they're quite pretty. Much prettier. I have spent most of my geological life despising shale, if you know what I mean. It's terrible to build on. Monkey stuff when you say it, but I was wrong. In the US, one of the big uh, shale reservoirs, the Marcellus from the Slovenians. Slightly older, it's Devonian. It's about 300 meters thick. It's got about 20% of total organic carbon. Okay, it's estimated to have 360 trillion cubic feet of gas. In Poland, Silurian shales, about 150 meters thick, variable um, oil and carbon. You need this high, as high as you can. But again, 200 TCFs, trillion cubic feet. Now, this is the Boland shales, carboniferous in West Lancashire. We'll come back to it in a minute. I thought it was 800 meters thick, okay? But I now believe that the limestone they bottomed in is not the carboniferous limestone. It's a limestone stringer in the Carboniferous, and there may well be 1,500 metres or so of Nemurian shales there. Okay, that's seven times as thick as the Marcellus shale, which the US has made hay with very successfully. So there are possibly, in some of the basins of the UK, shed loads of shale. You've got to be careful how you say that. <laughs> so where in the UK? Well. Obviously, the Midland Valley of Scotland, because for donkey's years, in the past, we extracted oil from shales there. I'm actually doing some work with people who were, who are looking for coal bed methane and shale there. The good old northeast, obviously. The West Lancashire Basin, which looks very small on there, but that's where, that's where these uh, resources seem to be very concentrated. Of course, probably beneath the Cheshire Basin. For sure. Worcester, Graben. And of course, we know we've got oil here because we're a rich farm, and there are quite a lot of places where we will have oil shales. And this is the bit, the Poland, the Poland shale, if you want to see it, go to the Pennines, the Vale of Poland, look to the right, the bits that stick out the sandstones, the bits that don't are shales. And there are various uh, projects underway. The one, of course, which everybody knows about, is Quadrilla in Lancashire here, but in the Vale of Pickering, Rathlin Energy, there's three sites in South Wales. This is a tricky one, good luck with this. Three sites in the Mendips, right? <coughs> Balcombe and West Sussex, strangely enough, an old friend I used to share a house with, this professor of engineering at Imperial College, he lives in Balcombe, actually. He's already phoned me about this. But never mind, I'm in Kent. <coughs> now, of course, that shouldn't necessarily surprise us. What we forget is we had 60 coal fields in the UK. Most of us have forgotten what coal looks like. You young folks come out of stroke in this. This is coal. Mysterious black rock goes on fire. Okay? That's a list of all the coal fields. And of course, Nye Bevan said this island is made mainly of coal and surrounded by fish. Only an organizing genius could produce a shortage of coal and fish at the same time. <laughs> a bit like now, isn't it? Except uh, uh, an island of coal surrounded by oil with a sea full of fish. And um, we managed to cock up most of those somehow or other. But these are the main potential places for CDM and shale gas. As you see, you know, it's probably there. Are unlikely to be uh, at least uh, first dibs on them. This is just the same thing. But the Bowling Shale is extremely thick. 
It comes past here, it comes past George Osborne's um, Macclesfield, Constituency uh, 2. And there are some important differences between solid and liquid hydrocarbons. Coal, we mostly exploit on land, petrol, land, and marine. Um, coal, usually about 1,000 metres, petrol, but greater than that. There's a lot of coal, and all of the reservoirs are restricted because most of it's gone. It's, look, it's a lucky break if you've trapped oil. Coal is usually fairly cheap to explore for. Oil is a bit expensive. A coal mine can last for a long time, at least it used to. <laughs> Sorry about door mill. I worked in work door mill, not underground, of course, some geophysical clean stuff. Geophysics has not been used much in coal, it's used greatly in petroleum. But in actual fact, shale gas is much more like coal in geographical and geological distribution. There's a lot of it in lots of places. And so to frack. Excuse me. It is not new. I monitored the very first frack, my frack, which took place in the UK. The PhD student of mine, Ian Bishop, with BP, while I was at Liverpool. Okay? It was in Beckingham, the onshore oil field in Lincolnshire. This is it. And these are tiny little seismic events we detected then. There have been about 220 fracks carried out in the UK. Right, who's heard of the 219 fracks before the quadrilla one? Some of you have, but I bet a lot of you never have. Okay. So 219 were carried out, actually, without anybody really taking a great deal of notice. For water, to increase the permeability of water. Almost always for engineered geothermal systems because granites don't have much permeability either. So you want to get hot water, or you want to get cold water into granite and hot water out, you've got to frack it too. <coughs> so a bit thin, a bit less so, but to increase the permeability of rocks like this, because not all not all coals have perfect permeability, despite looking very fractured. The actual internal matrix is actually quite reluctant to give up. So hydrofracking is not new. But what do we do? <coughs> well, if you believe the Daily Mail, we make this pact with the devil, right? <laughs> we bring people up and we inject them into the ground with high pressure. <laughs> Depends whether you're doing the, uh, development uh, or you're actually doing exploration. Exploration, you usually drill a vertical well down, and the uppermost part where it passes through aquifers has to be very well engineered. You generally have at least three rings of soil okay, going down to various depths. Then you drill down to somewhere where you've got shale. Okay. I'll then leap to this one because this is a bit more instructive. If you're actually going to exploit that, you will usually use deviated drilling. Now, there are two things which have made shale gas possible, one of which is that you can drill down and go around corners now. Okay, and that came from coal, that didn't really come from petroleum. They were doing this in, this, in Australia, drilling hundreds of metres in coal seams uh, when I was there in the, 19, in the 1980s. So one of it is that you can drill horizontally. The second is that you can actually create additional fracturing for additional permeability. How do you do it? This is a bit that scares everybody because this is a this is a continuous uh, metal tube, and in order to get to it, you've got to make some holes in it. You make it like a colander, and you actually do it by tiny little explosive charges, which you fracture or you puncture this. Right? The explosive charges have nothing to do with the actual hydrofracturing process. It's just simply a way to get water out of a pipe into the rock. Then you've actually got to put pressure in, which is higher than the pressure the rocks are naturally at. Now, how are those rocks naturally in pressure? Well, because of the weight of rock above you. It's rho density times gravity times h. Okay? And if you work that out to a, a depth of about three kilometers, it's somewhere between it's about five to six thousand pounds per square inch. The Americans use good old imperial units, so we'll stick with that today because we can't convert it in my head to Pascal's, which is what it should be. <coughs> Can you? 350 bar. 350 bar, that'll do nicely. That'll do nicely. And if you actually put pressure in, which is greater than that lithostatic pressure, 
you can cause the rock to fracture. And that's what hydrofracking is. Okay, so the, the fluid actually pushes the rock apart along fractures which look a bit like this, they look wedge shaped. I'll talk about this a bit more later. Okay? But if you take the pressure off, they'll close straight away. So that's actually not very useful. So you've got to put something in to stop them closing, and what you put in is sand. Or a ceramic equivalent. If you have got a lot of money, you can buy ceramic particles, tiny little things, same size as sand particles, and you can put them in. You get a slightly better packing because they're actual spears. And a few other chemicals, and we'll come to them in a minute. Just the same thing, just a bit more. We have surface casing, which will probably be down to about 500 feet. We have that cemented as we go through the aquifers. Now, if you like, this is an important part of any hydrocarbon experiment. Shale gas is no different from that point of view to conventional oil and gas. That is where you have to be very good and very careful. Down here, you're three kilometers away. Here, you're only a few hundred meters away. And those hydraulic fractures, they form and they, they are aligned along the maximum compression. In any stress within the Earth, there's three components, one of which is the maximum compression, one which is the maximum tension, and then there's one which is between the two. And if you, if you stress a rock, it generally forms fractures which more or less go along the line of compression, but open in the direction of extension. And that's what you want. It's more complicated when you get real rock, but that's the theory of it. So the key to fracking is a good cement. This bit here is critical. If it was that easy to get gas from three kilometers, there wouldn't be any there for us to go for. Okay? It's actually very reluctant to come from there. Now, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but this is all of the hydrofracts which have been carried out in the Barnard Shale in the US. They're vertical, and they're vertical up and they're vertical down extents, mapped from seismology. This is all of the aquifers, right, mapped by various hydrogeological methods. Okay? You can quite clearly see that there is a really large distance between most of these hydrofracts and the aquifers. Now that's really important. You don't want anything from here getting into here. Right? But an aquifact, in most of these cases, there's something like, what, five, six thousand feet of distance between the two. And there are the rocks, of course, there are the rocks which are not all permeable. And there's, there's a really two ways to, to frack. In one case, you, use, you don't use water, you use a, a viscous gel, a bit like hair gel, not so smelly. And that makes fractures which are short and fat. That's what you tend to use if you want to get more oil out of a reservoir. That's a, a gel fracture. They're large but short fractures. What they use in shale gas is what's called slick water. We'll come back to that in a minute. But it gives long, slim fractures which go a long way. Okay. And this, is, this has been carried out to 100,000 or so fracks already done in the US. Felt size misty is extremely rare. We'll come back to that later. And we want tiny little size misses. We have no way of knowing what's going on deep in the earth without the tiny fractures which happen, which tell us where the rock is talking to us. Okay, that's what this is. We get thousands and thousands of these. They're tiny, magnitude zero and less, and they tell you where the fracture's gone. So how far can they go? Well, Richard Davis and I have been doing some work, a guy at Durham, uh, we just got the second paper. This is his, his paper we've actually just written one on induced seismicity. What Richard's done, he's taken all of the natural fracks, sorry, all of the stimulated fracks, and also the ones that nature does itself. Because nature fracks rock with fluids, with magma, with various things, with gas sometimes, and actually determined the heights of it. And the maximum a frack has ever grown, as far as we know, is 600 meters, 2,000 feet. There's only one chance of it, one percent chance of it getting more than 350 meters, and almost bugger all chance of it getting to that 600 meters. 
That actually gives you a useful parameter that you should not frack within 600 meters of an aquifer because there is at least some small chance, and that's what we call the government. And of course, you'll have seen this if you watch gas lands. Somebody liked to his tap. If he'd had any sense, he'd have separated out this gas, used it for his cooker, and poured his water on it. Gas has been burning out of taps in Pennsylvania since they put taps in Pennsylvania. <laughs> because it's naturally occurring, most of it. Right? This, is, this was happening before they fracked there. Yeah? Gas lands is not a good uh, source of data. And of course, in the US, they don't do things as well as us. Uh, that's certainly true. They have been fracking at depths of much less than 2,000 feet, which is a bad thing to do. And they put chemicals in it. Fracking fluid. Called fracking fluid. Right? Oh, don't be shopping. This is water. It's very nice, but it's all right. Uh, what have we got here? Sand. Build the sand. To show you how brave it actually tasted a bit of that. You've all tasted a bit on the, the beach when you kiss. Silicon dioxide won't kill you. Probably not much more than that amount. I can't be bothered to put them in there. What else do we want? A bit of salt. I love salt, I always love salt. My mother told me not to eat it, that's probably new blood pressure. So a bit of salt. <laughs> what else have we got here? Okay. Just lemon. Some acid in there. About this kind of concentration. Of this kind of thing, right? And that's all right too. Salt wouldn't be vinegar. <laughs> I do turn funny right now. <laughs> A bit of biocide, this is. you've ever done the washing up, you'll know what washing up picture tastes like, don't you? <laughs> right. All of this constituents, only when I turn my nose up with washing up liquid. <laughs> Give or take, that's fracking fluid. Alright? Not quite as scary as the Daily Mail would actually have to believe. Right, who does the washing up? Don't lie to me students, right, for a start. <laughs> Don't lie to me gentlemen, right? But who washes the car? Okay? Be honest, you must have used this important results standard sick for on your drive. That's what it says on the back, okay? Right, non-ionic non surfactants, that's actually detergent. Amphoteric surfactants, a lot of detergent. Disinfectant. Okay. Dimethyl ethyl glycol. That's a bit like um, uh, windscreen washer fluid. And everybody goes down, firing into the atmosphere all through the winter. <laughs> Methyl chloroisothiazol. That's good, isn't it? I did that well. Here's one here. Two bromo to nitropropane. That's an organic liquid of some kind. It's in washing up liquid. 
few other things. I did say the fracking people, the problem is you're not putting enough perfume in it, right? <laughs> this is mint and rosemary. <laughs> but when you wash your car, do you collect the liquid in special sealed containers and do you take it to a license disposal site? Do you book a right? Do you know how close you are to an aquifer when you pour that water on the ground? Do you know? Where's the hydrogeologist here? Do the hydrogeologist who's going to admit to that? How, how close are we to an aquifer here? It could be less than one meter. Less than one meter, right? Which is most likely to get into our aquifer? You washing or fracking? Good point, isn't it? Okay. That's for that need to practice with my head. So. But of course there are other concerns too. <coughs> Let's start down here. Contamination of groundwater due to poor well designed failure. Yeah, we need to do it right. Contamination of groundwater due to mobilization of solutes and methane. If it was that easy. There wouldn't be a shed load of gas down here in this shale, right? Okay, okay, so that's the fracking bit down there. Contamination of soil surface of groundwater due to spills of chemicals or return fluids. Right, that's you washing your car, okay? That's true of any hydrocarbon exercise. You just can't be cavalier with liquids. And that could transport the treatment of waste waters. That's true of sewage, that's true of farmers taking um, cow milk to spread in the fields. Right, how good is that actually in your aquifers? Is that good or not, Mr. Hydrogeologist? No, not good at all. Cryptosporidium, all sorts of other things. Um, fugitive emissions of methane. Okay, I have a picture in here. I've got, I've got a picture of two guys standing around a tiny little couple of bubbles on the top of a wellhead. Anything like that is reported as a, a well failure. We're probably smoking if I remember these sort of guys. Do you know where more. You know in Europe where most of the methane emissions, future emissions, come from? You'd like to think so. From the pipelines that bring gas from the Stockman field in Siberia. Right? Because they're in thousands of kilometers. I have been told, I don't know how true this is, that in some parts of the Soviet Union, all over the tundra where they're actually flexing because the tundra's melting, there's a 10% on average, it's one and a half percent leakage of those pipelines, and it's methane. Now, methane isn't 22 times as bad as CO2. Over my 20 years, which is all I'm prepared to think about, it's 75 times worse than CO2. So, 75 times one and a half is actually about 111. Okay? Bringing the gas has got a higher carbon footprint than burning it at the other end. So sourcing gas from 5,000 kilometers away by pipeline, that's where fugitive emissions come from. Okay, another sermon here. <laughs> right, so I don't actually buy into that one, but it's from water use and hydraulic fracture. Okay. okay. I always say to people, have you got gas? I don't actually, sorry. You got gas? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, where do you get it from? I know, pipe. <laughs> <laughs> But you all want gas, don't you? Because 70% of our domestic heating and cooking in the UK is gas. Right? 50% of our energy generation on some days is gas too. But we don't want to generate. We want the Siberians to actually have all the crap end of it. Okay? Because it's fungible, you see. What they put in at that end <coughs> comes out the other end just the same. They have no regulations like this. We've got the water framework directive and the groundwater. Daughter Directive, blah, 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 the Environment Permitting Regulations, we've got the Mine Waste Directive, Abstraction Licensing, etc. A friend of mine is the chairman of Ineos Claw, Runcorn. If he tips a can of coke in his wastewater, he exceeds his discharge emissions. One can of coke. Right? That's how we regulate the UK, and that's good. Right? This is it's places like this we should be doing. Not Siberia. Yeah, okay, one of the arguments is uses a lot of water. Yes, it does use a great deal of water. Each frack uses about as much water as it would take to irrigate a large field. Okay. In the Barnet in Texas, 83% is public supply, 4% is mining, 6% is irrigation, 2% is livestock, just less than half of the shale gas. That's one of the biggest shale gas producing states. Arkansas, 
Can't see why it's only that much of other water somewhere. Point one shale gas, uh, Texas, point eight again, Pennsylvania, less than one percent point one percent of the water usage is actually for shale gas. That's not exactly a gigantic call. Livestock and irrigation are by far part of domestic supplies, the major users of water. Doesn't mean that water can't be I'm going to be treated carefully. I'm going to the Cannon Basin in Australia. Water is a scarce resource there. And so the quadrilla. So quadrilla came from Texas. Okay. Very sensibly, they thought the Bowling Basin was a very good prospect. <clears throat> but I know I've known one of their directors for more than 40 years, Peter Turner, because we did our PhDs together. Okay. And I said to him, Peter, you know what you want to do before you do this? You want to do some microseismic monitoring and a bit more geophysics. To which the Texan said, what does he know about hydrofracking? So they didn't. So they started fracking. The Boland Basins up here, this is the file down here, Boland Basin runs through here. There's a lot of faults. There's more than they thought, actually, as we'll see. The Boland Basin is a bit <coughs> unusual in that most of Lancashire has got thick coal measures, the Boland Basin doesn't. Okay. Erosion, uplift and erosion has taken place, so that some 1,500 metres of coal measures have gone, which is quite unusual. Perhaps there's a clue in the fact as to how that actually got it there, but we'll come back to that in a minute. But that actually means that uh, you've got the, uh, the, uh, the Boland shale much shallower than you might have, which is good for some things. And so off they start. These defects, that's a tiny little hydrofrac, okay? You pump in about 30,000 gallons, which is that much, 130 cubic meters, okay? Because that allows you to determine how well it will frack, and also tells you which direction it will frack to. And then you pump in quite a bit, about half, um, half a billion gallons, half a million gallons, sorry, which as I say about uh, irrigated field. All goes well, first of all. They do the second one, and on the 1st of April, they have a magnitude 2.3 seismic event. I did say you should be micro seismic monitoring to them. I did use, I told you so there. And the casing actually was deformed. It's not necessarily a good thing. However, they let them carry on, and they did another one, a smaller one, and then they tried another one, and we had a magnitude 1.5 seismic event. It has to be said, felt seismic events are extremely rare in hydrofracking. It turns out there have only been three reported circumstances, one here, one in Arkansas, and one in British Columbia, and they all happened in 2011 for some reason. So there was a conversation between myself, Deck, and Quadrilla, which said, we better look at this, lads. And that's the Blackpool 2.3 event detected here at Kiel, and on our side of the here. Okay, so it's not gigantic, but it's quite a... A nice little okay, so up we went and put in what we would have liked to put in before, some seismic protection equipment. And we start to get beautiful little earthquakes. Not everybody thinks they'll be beautiful earthquakes. <laughs> it's all a matter of personal taste. <coughs> now what you see here is, well it's about a magnitude half earthquake actually. You've got a vertical component of ground motion, in other words, up and down like this. Now these are both um, horizontals. Now I can't remember which is which, but one of those is north-south and one of those is east-west. So if you've got all three of those components, you completely know what the ground motion is. But something unusual is happening here. You'll see that energy arrives much earlier on this vertical component and much later on these horizontal components. Now that's what we like to see. We actually mathematically manipulated earthquake seismograms to get that. Because what that tells us is that the energy is coming straight up into that vertical component. In other words, that vertical component is pointing down to where the earthquake is. Which means it was right below the seismic monitor, which is a bit of a giveaway. And the time difference between there and there is a measure of how far away it is. That's actually three kilometres. So within ten minutes, Stimo and I had said, you've got an earthquake, right below you, it's three kilometres away. There's another one. They actually did contract in a, a Czech company, who were actually very good, but spent six months actually telling them much the same thing in a much more complicated way, but that's not the point. 
uh, we knew we knew the weapon. We knew the local two. And the other strange thing is, if you take five of the events, and these are not the same size, they've been scaled to be the same size, they range from a half up to one and a half, they look identical, apart from the fact that some are bigger. Now what does that tell you? It tells you it had exactly the same source mechanism, the same, the rock fractured in exactly the same way, and it travelled through exactly the same path on the way to the surface. So they all come from the same place. There's a slight thing in here, and the, on these P waves, these early waves, some are up and some are down, which actually tells you what it is, probably, is a fault which is moving horizontally, but doing this. So sometimes it's an upward kick first, sometimes it's a downward kick first. One of the MSCs is going to have a look at that in some detail. He's going to look just at this tiny little bit of all of the seismograms to see whether we can work out whether that is actually the case. And we play games with earthquakes or seismologists. This is called a Gutenberg Richter plot. You've heard of Richter of the magnitude, and you probably might have heard of Gutenberg. We plot the log of the number of events against their magnitude. In other words, um, you don't get many big ones. As you go smaller, you get more and more. Now, usually it will work out that if you go from 2 to 1, you get 10 times more. 1 to 0, another 10 times more, in other words, 100 more. That's not the case here. This slope of this line should be 1 if that's the case, and it's only a half. Now, I won't go into detail, but what that says is there weren't a lot of small events. And the reason is it was a fault which already existed, which was moving. It wasn't new rock being fractured. New rock being fractured would have had a slope which looked like that. That is. Okay. So this is a bit of a giveaway again, that this was a pre-existing feature. Now induced earthquakes, we've known about them for a long time. Usually when you're injecting water into the ground, and one in Uzbekistan has been as high as 7.2 in Ghazli, that's a big one. Most of them are about magnitude 5 in the US. Okay, like this. In southern Spain, actually taking water out of the ground created an earthquake because they took 250 metres of groundwater, which is a huge mass, and the upward rebound caused an earthquake. So you mess with the water <coughs> on the ground uh, very cautiously. But these are the kind of criteria. Are these events the first known earthquakes in the region? Of course they were. Blackpool's not very really seismic expert. Is there a correlation between injection and seismicity? Yes. Are the epicenters near wells? Yes. Do they occur at injection depth? Yes. And are the changes in the fluid pressure sufficient? Well, obviously they were. So it was an induced earthquake, induced by quadrilateral. And you can see this. This is the stages of the pumping. Okay, the first one. The second one, a big burst of activity which dies away. Not much there. That's probably because there's something called the Kaiser effect. It says, once you stress the rock to a certain level, it won't start emitting acoustic energy until you stress it to more than that level again. So probably that second small injection didn't push it to that limit. Later on here, it appears that they did, and they had these other earthquakes, but you can see they do correlate very well. So not much argument about the fact that they... And that's the core. In actual fact, the core is actually striated. It looks very much like, well, this isn't, okay? That means probably there's been motion. It's been something that goes slick inside. <coughs> it actually moved in some sense at 8,000 feet. Now we have earthquakes in the UK. These are all the ones bigger than four. There's not that many. The maximum we might get, get from one of those plots is actually about six. We've had five in a bit. Might have had six in the Dogger Bank. And they occur deeper in the earth. They all occur at about 15 kilometres. Now, why is that? Because the rocks have to be a certain strength to give you a magnitude four. Right? The rock is not strong enough, you won't get a magnitude four. This is a plot of the smaller events. Okay? This is isostatic rebound of northern Scotland, still 10,000 years after the ice. That's the Fife and Midlothian coal fields, that's the Northumberland coal field, that's the Workington coal field, that's the Lancashire coal field, 
That's Nottingham, Leicester, etc. Coalfield. This is the North Staff Coalfield. That's the South Wales Coalfield. Not all coalfield events, but at least 50% of the events on there are mining induced. And mining induced events in the U in this neck of the woods, the rest of the UK, will generate about a magnitude of three years. <coughs> because that's as strong as these kind of rocks are. Okay. So I am fairly confident in saying that you cannot generate in carboniferous rocks said, an event bigger than <coughs> Now, most people don't actually have any appreciation of just how small the slips are during earthquakes. Here's a magnitude 6 earthquake. The slip on that earthquake is less than a metre. Okay? It's over a distance of about um, 10 kilometres, however. Okay? A magnitude 4 has a slip of 10 centimetres on a 1 to 4 kilometre fall. A magnitude a Blackpool event is about three millimetres of slip on a 200 metre fog. That's not a lot. Okay? And most hydraulic fracture events are a fraction of a millimetre on a few metres fog. As are most mining events. I was always surprised by how small the displacement was. And strangely, over the last 50 days, we've had a lot of mining induced earthquakes. Which I believe we have. Nottingham, um, Ollerton, Lloyd will correct me if I've got these. My steak, right? That's a prop bake. Well, it's actually closest to East Leak, actually, uh, gypsum mining. New Ollerton. One of these is Astley. Now, why do we have those? Those be, yeah, those be. <coughs> yeah. That's a speculation. Hydrogeological changes. Now, long wall cone mining generates earthquakes. That's how we know about the mechanics of this. In a long wall mine, we take all the coal out, this is a shearer here, this is a conveyor belt, and we let it collapse. And it collapses in a progressive way, hopefully. Rocks fall into here, they then, then deform, we get bedding separation, eventually, hopefully, we get a smooth surface substance. And we get lots and lots of earthquakes. This is actually Coventry Colony. This is one day of monitoring, right? Hundreds of earthquakes, tiny little ones all around the face. That's good, that tells you what's going on. They're friends, not foes. And most of them look like this. They have a little P wave and a little S wave, they're lovely little creatures. There's another one, this is going back a long way. This is Kinhydra, from this kind of neck of the woods. Beautiful, crisp. This is when we played it out on pens, which. <coughs> Well, UV on, on, on film, right? That's how we'll um... But also another thing happens which is much more akin to hydrofracking. In these mines, you get instantaneous outbursts of gas, where this coal disintegrates in millions of cubic feet of methane. And that's one of them there. In 1982, my, this white, my wife had our first child just here. <laughs> so while my wife was pregnant, I was actually running through these records, trying to keep an eye on her. And then we had a baby, and I was still trying to process this. But the events are not like those other events. They have this musical note, single. And this is what happens when you hydrofrack. You force a fluid into a fracture. In this case, it's gas into coal. In hydrofrac, it's water into a fracture. Hydrofrac events look like this, are called mode <coughs> 1 failures. Earthquakes are mode 2 failures when the rock does this. This is just was my sketch of what actually happened during it. That's another story. But what was interesting, this is methane monitored in the mine, what's called a BM1 monitor for those of you who know these things. That's micro seismicity measured a kilometre away on the surface. Pretty good correlation. Correlation is not causation, everybody says. That bloody is right though, I tell you. <laughs> and we actually devised a system which controlled that mine. But induced events like this happen in younger rocks. Okay? Hydrofrac occurs in even weaker rocks. So it's unlikely we will actually exceed magnitude 3. Now the US Academy of Sciences published a paper which says that if you have an earthquake at 10 
kilometers, it has to be magnitude 5 before you feel it at the surface. At 1 to 2 kilometers, it, it can be just about felt at magnitude 3. Now, in fact, since the Blackwell earthquake, we've had a new number of earthquakes. All those ones I showed you on that plot in the last 50 days are all bigger than the Blackwell earthquake. Within a few months, we actually had a magnitude 2.5 here, bigger than the Blackwell earthquake. How many people reported that? The same number are sitting on that front bench there. Three people in the whole of the potteries even got out of bed and could be asked to write the sentiment. Okay. The paper doesn't ring round me round here unless it's a magnitude two. We're more stoical than stoic. <coughs> now, strangely enough, in 2011, we had a couple of other examples. This is an Arkansas. This is not actually hydrofracking. This is wastewater injection. That's a bad idea. Pumping wastewater deep into the ground has been shown to be very tricky. But they actually activated this fault. Okay? They had a magnitude 4.7. Why do they have a 4.7? <coughs> because their geology is stronger. That is not Kilometer's rock theory. And another one here in British Columbia. <coughs> they had a, a burst of events here and a burst of events here associated with this fault. They actually had done 8,000 hydrofracks before they had that. So it wasn't exactly something that happened all the time with hydrofracking. No property damage, nobody injured. Now to say in the papers, small earthquake, nobody killed. And they have a very good picture of the seismicity. And actually what they see is, this is the fracking in general. Then they cross the fault, and the seismicity indicates a much deeper feature here. <coughs> Now, thousands and thousands of fractures, hydrofracture being done in the States. This is a plot of their magnitude along the bottom against depth. The deeper you go, the bigger they get. Plus a small energy to store. Okay. Almost without exception, they are as this one here, they are less than magnitude a half. Now a magnitude a half is something like um, something like 900 times less energy than the Blackpool earthquake. The Blackpool earthquake sits up here. <coughs> these are not felt. These cannot be felt. Okay. Uh, actually, someone who's sensitized to it might feel magnitude one. Usually it's one and a half. In Nottinghamshire, when we monitor, people will feel a one because they got used to it. What also they did is they looked at the slope of those lines that I pointed out. And what seems to be the case is that below a half, the fractures do this, in other words, tensile failures. Above that, they do this. So they turn from hydrofract events to earthquakes, if you like. Okay. So, we were asked by DEC to look at all of this. Three of us, Chris Green, Brian Bapti from DEC and myself. And we said several things, one of which, what I'd already said them before, why don't you do some seismic monitoring before you start, you fools? Because if you don't, then the earthquake should happen. We'll be blamed on you. Okay? So it's best to you know, spend a few hundred grand. It's cost them 10 million quid now to do this monitoring. 100 grand is a slip. <coughs> Look where all the faults are. Okay? You're using 3D seismics. There's no one who this costs a bit of money. They've had to do it now. And also look to see what the ground conditions are because vibrations at the surface depend exactly and critically on what your geology is. Some rock, okay, some rock, not. And also, when they frack, okay, they pump it in and they leave it there. Because they think they actually get better um, fractures. You don't, because once you've done the frack, there's no more energy left. If you leave the water in, the water will go through sand one, but the water will go looking for faults to interfere with. Put less in, don't put more than you need, and immediately, you can see when the frack happens because the pressure drops. Pump it out again, right? The sand's in there. Don't hang about pumping water into the ground. That's a really bad idea. And uh, this is easy. Initially, they wanted, Cordell wanted to have a magnitude of 1.7. They were advised by a German group. 
that 1.7 would be the threshold at which it would be okay to work to. We said not because of the work that I've just shown you, that something mechanical happens at about between 0.5. So we invented a traffic light system. Yeah. It's, in detail, it's in detail here. There's been a lot of discussion about this, mostly because people have not read what we actually wrote here. If the earthquakes are less than zero, bam, rock on. If the earthquakes are between 0 to 0 0.5, say, just wait a minute, right? You can complete the job. You have to pump water out, okay? Do a mini frack. No more earthquakes, carry on, okay? But don't put any more water in. If it's 0 0.5, okay, and more, stop for a while and see what happens to the seismicity. If the seismicity doesn't rise, to 1.5, okay, you can carry on cautiously. If it goes to 1.5, pump the water out and stop doing that thing. So it's not 0.5, it's 1.5 is the actual stopping point, which not many people have actually read this properly to actually find that out. Nobody switched yet in Iceland, is it? Even if there is, I'm going to insult you, because we're rarely more conservative than the Swiss. But the Swiss thresholds are actually 2.3. <coughs> Unfortunately, they then had the 3.5 Basel earthquake, and the insurance claims from that have been many billions of pounds. Mm. Mostly because everybody said, I've got a crack here, right, pay me. And they paid everybody. Almost certainly, hardly any of that damage was actually due to that 3.5 earthquake, but it depends whether you want to get involved in mitigation, and they didn't. Yeah? I've spoke to the guy who, who said this, and he said, I bet he wish he had 0.5. So, and of course, so those are rules we've actually said, well, not rules, the recommendations we've made to government. Right? Don't put any more water in than you need. Take it out when you're finished with it. Look at your seismicity. If your seismicity goes through these levels, there's uh, authorities sitting on top of this. The most difficult is not DEC or EA or HSC. Which one is it? Local planning authorities, for sure. Everybody <coughs> here probably uh, agrees with that. That's exploration. Similar for development. Again, probably the most difficult. And this is what is exercising Quadril at the minute. Uh, they have to do six separate EIAs for every one of their wells. So they've actually delayed their drilling uh, for next year. Which is a bit of a pity. So we concluded the risk of significant seismic activity associated with hydraulic fracture in the UK is small and damage is extremely unlikely and that it can continue under a regime of careful macro seismic and geomechanical monitoring but I still leave a few research questions if you'd like me to get money to work on that's how it works right or we'll have some nice questions why does triggered earthquakes occur in some places and not others is it what you're doing is it geology is it how you're doing it can you alter the injection practices and you can you can frack with CO2. You don't have to frack with water. In dry places in the world, probably far better to frack with nitrogen or CO2. The compressed, the liquids, right, have much less uh, environmental issues. It costs more, though. And once a significant earthquake, if it occurs, what should you do? And we've probably already dealt with that. And how do you regulate this? And I wrote an article, I was asked to write an article, a head-to-head -head piece, uh, Myself and Caroline Lucas, I'm the one on the left. <laughs> Strangely enough, Caroline Lucas doesn't agree with Fracky. She doesn't actually agree. She takes the ideological position we're describing for. We don't want any hydrocarbons at all. Okay, that's fine, Caroline. I'll see you on your bike. We will have won the coal mine. When the coal fired power stations are closed, you have to ask yourself where are we going to get it from economically? In other words, not pay top dollar to overbid the Japanese for the liquefied natural gas. Ethically, in other words, the, so the poor Siberians don't have all of the crap at their end, we just have the clean gas at the other end, and as environmentally as possible. So I'll leave it to you to decide where that should be, but I'll give you a hint, it's probably shale gas. 